Now, gold dealership firm Men's Gold may be holding on to as much as 200 million Ghana CDs of depositors' funds. That's according to the first official estimates as given by the finance minister. Ken Oforiata, who was addressing a deba with officers and men of the Ghana Armed Forces at Burma Camp, says government has initiated moves to liquidate assets of the company. It comes as agitations continue amongst customers of the company for government to intervene in the situation. There's several officers and men of the Ghana Armed Forces are said to have invested with the company. I think it's a very unfortunate um, situation and it goes to the core for us as a nation in terms of discipline and management of our own resources. Um, I think it's not only you, um, soldiers, um, but there were people at Ministry of Finance, people at Bank of Ghana, and I think it goes to the core of, of where we are through the banking consolidation that we have had. Uh, because really, for most people at the Ministry and the Bank of Ghana, you know that if somebody is investing in gold, there's just no way they can give you 20%. So we need to examine ourselves as to the type of sentiment, whether it is um, overzealousness um, to get a return, which is impossible, and therefore what element of greed we have that we are exercising this. And when a company does not have um, a license to do something and you choose to go there, um, I think it's an issue that we need to contend with. So, I think we have come up with a realization that maybe over 200 million um, and change is outstanding. Um, he has been apprehended in um, Dubai. Uh, I'm sure a committee will be put together to see how to liquidate uh, and whatever it is that can be found can be given to those who gave money. Uh, but government is not going to be standing in, you know, for for issues of this nature where we are very clear that it is not um, licensed and you know the risk that you have taken. Um, so that's really the point. You know, we are spending about over 11 billion um, for the licensed banks, uh, which is about maybe 2 million depositors. Uh, and that has put an excessive strain on the Treasury. Moving on, residents of four communities in the Amansia South District of the Ashanti region are protesting the Asanko gold mine's failure to offer them jobs and pay compensation on their land. The indigents in the Konyase electoral area, including residents of Koninase, Mansul Krang, Dediase, and Kwanchebo, met at Mansul in Krang. Lava firm's Kwesi Debra report. <laughs> Residents in their morning clothes blocked one of the main routes leading to the company's mine site. They say repeated complaints to the mining firm over the years have yielded no positive results. Residents also accuse the company of preventing them from accessing dam site for livelihood. Spokesperson George Dia says they are always chased away by the security personnel. <laughs> The mining firm employs so many non-natives. They've cleared all our cocoa farms. Even when we go to the dam site, they chase us away. Asanko Gold, however, says its workforce include people whose applications were endorsed by community leaders as natives. Charles Amwa is executive general manager. We have a very stringent employment uh, policy and procedure uh, to ensure that uh, we employ locals from the catchment area. We have as a way of uh, monitoring and managing the local employment, develop verification forms which must be verified and uh, an applicant who applies for a position on the mine which, which skill can be obtained from the local must have his application endorsed by three opinion leaders 
with the chief, the unit committee chairman, and the assembly headman. So all applications that will be processed must come to the committee. I have got all this verification uh, done, which uh, is available for uh, verification if uh, required. Mr. Amwa as activities of residents around the dam site expose them to potential danger for which the firm can be held responsible. For the past uh, two weeks, we realized the influx of uh, people from the community have been trooping onto our operational area uh, on the lease. And we as a mining company have got the obligation to ensure the safety of all on the mine. In fact, it's a requirement by Mincom that the safety of all is taken very paramount by the manager of the mine. So when we realize the influx of the community onto the waste dam over the two week period, management sat down and decided to put in measures that will not be attractive for the people to trip onto the dam, which is an unactive mining area. Reporting for Joy News, Kwasi Debra. The Inter-Ministerial Task Force on Illegal Mining has arrested 13 Chinese miners and a Ghanaian at the Amina State Forest in the central region. Richard Kujunyaku, who travelled with the task force, reports hundreds of acres of land are being destroyed on a daily basis by the illegal miners. The task force has been combing many forest areas in the central region. Illegal miners here are still having a field day, destroying many rivers and water bodies, as well as large tracts of farmlands. At the Aminasi forests, the devastation was unimaginable when the task force stormed there. Francis Asibiabu is the head of the Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining. Here, we arrested a uh, 13 Chinese, 24 excavators, and uh, the, the, the local in charge was arrested but granted bail too. Uh, a Ghanaian was arrested but granted bail. We, we, we had their excavators, and that is what we took with themselves. He is urging the communities to continue volunteering the task force with information about the activities of illegal miners so they could be dealt with. They are cooperating and they are giving us more information on uh, other activities elsewhere, hidden machines. In fact, they are volunteering the information to us, the locals. Uh, no, the locals. The, the, no, not the assemblymen. The, yeah, the locals. Yeah, indigents. yeah the indigents. They, yeah, the residents. They are volunteering information for us. The youth here have taken over where the illegal miners left off and are scavenging for minerals. Richard Kwejenyako, Joy News, Cape Coast. Cocoa farmers in the Ejusu Jabi municipality of the Shanti region are seeking the intervention of the Santahene Otu Force to to the second to help them retrieve a takeover of their farms for the purpose of an industrial enclave. Over 5,000 hectares of cocoa farms owned by nearly 3,000 people have reportedly been earmarked for destruction. The Ghana National Association of Cocoa Farmers is backing affected farmers in seven communities with protests. President of the association, Anani Boating, says a timely intervention by the custodian of land in the Shanti Kingdom is crucial. Nana Asensu Mensa has more in this report. Farmers at Onye, Abinase, Ejinase, Asapon, Odahon, Amodu, and Sensuaso fear losing large hectares of farms if the initiative is carried out. 68 year old Kofiapia walks through his cocoa farm, his only source of income to support his family. The thoughts of potential loss of his livelihood weighs heavily on him each moment. Taken away, forcibly. If it's taken away from me, it will affect my life greatly. Because that is where I get my livelihood. My my children are at school. How am I going to pay their school fees? My no, we have other facilities, other birds to settle at home. If the farm is taken away from me, I don't know how I'm going to make my living. It will be difficult. In fact, it will be very difficult for me. And I. I don't know how much they are going to give me. And it doesn't matter how much they give me. 
I cannot go and struggle in town. Okay. The government should help us. The government is expecting one million tons of cocoa. And if he allows these people to destroy our cocoa farms, I don't know how he's going to achieve that objective. A Japoku who has been farming all his life says taking his farm from him is like taking his life. If they cut down the cocoa trees and I lose this farm, I might lose my life as well. The leadership of Coco Farmers Association has stepped in solidarity with the farmers. They argue such a decision will not help government's quest to achieve its target of one million tons of cocoa. The association also thinks it will be a disincentive to get the youth to venture into farming. Frank Autry is national organizer. It's a disincentive for the youth within the town, seven communities, to even think of even going into a co-farm. And it's going to affect people, other youth, within Ghana. They believe, after exhausting all avenues for redress, the association is compelled to fall on a two for Anani Boateng is president of the association. The lands are for Nananum, of course. But if Nananum do not take a good measures as an association and as a president, I think I will also petition them to Otunfu so that at least Otunfu should also come in and then help the situation. Nana Asensu Mensa reporting. Yeah, in Accra, business activities came to a halt on Friday at the new Mokola shopping mall in Accra as the fire gutted a section of the market. Firefighters spent close to 10 hours trying to put out the fire which started at 7 in the morning. The fire destroyed some goods stored at the basement of the building. Ifwa Evans Chinri has more. According to eyewitnesses who spoke to the news team, the attention was drawn to the billowing smoke when some workers at the affected shop rushed out screaming for help. They say although fire service personnel arrived on time, they struggled to put out the fire. This morning, when we got here, we saw some of the workers who were rushing out of the shop. So we asked them what the situation was, and they told us there was fire at the basement. The fire service arrived, and we all rushed out to find out what the problem was. I got here at 7.30, jobs, but after asking me, it was from the basement. National Fire Service L. He said the fire affected the basement of the shopping mall and excessive smoke emanating from there prevented firemen from entering the building. We don't have the cause of the fire now. But then this morning around 7.46, we had a, uh, somebody, a taxi driver came to the fire station just about 100 meters away from here to report that there was a fire outbreak. So our men had to use the incoming routes just behind you to come this way. So we had to clear all the cars. It has to take us two minutes to get to uh, the fire scene. As I speak to you now, our men are trying to control the fire. The unfortunate thing is that there's a lot of smoke at the basement, and so it's impeding firefighting. But we have a smoke extractor over here that is extracting the smoke to assist us to do it. We don't have the cause of fire now, but we have a lot of hair wicks over there. We don't know the cause of the fire. We have a lot of hair wicks over there. The basement. Accra Mayor Ni Ajay Soa, who visited the scene, explained although the fire had been quenched, it was a struggle stopping the billowing smoke. Uh, what I'm told of is that uh, the fire started around 7.45 a.m. But it has a two-story basement, which is used as a warehouse. So, and there's a lot of... Uh, um, headgears, wig, and all kinds of materials which are all inflammable. I, I do not know, and the fire service also do not know, there's a lot of smoke, and it's a basement. 
so the fire subsides uh, at this moment the fire service are done so well to extract a lot of the smoke um, they are using the gas and uh, their head marks to go under the basement to be able to find out exactly what the issues are Fast. The office of the Clerk of Parliament says it is unable to identify MPs who have been cited for contempt for displaying bloody widow placards from the House's video footage. The Speaker had directed that the minority MPs who displayed the placards earlier this month be identified from the footage and referred to the Privileges Committee after the leadership of the minority refused to apologize for their conduct. Deputy Majority Leader Adrasafo says the identification has been impossible. Joseph Opokugaku has more. The day that Ayawa West Wagon MP Lydia Sarah Malhassan was sworn in, the minority MPs walked out of the chamber and in walking out, they brought out the placard with the various inscriptions describing her as a bloody widow. Days later, the issue was brought to the attention of the speaker formally and following a back and forth debate, he directed that the leadership on the minority side apologizes for those placards that were displayed, but they resisted and insisted they weren't going to do that. So the directive was the clerk should look at the footage, identify the specific MPs who were holding the placard so that they will be referred to the Privileges Committee. Well, today, the Deputy Majority Leader Joseph gave an update on that. And the clerk's office is that indeed the tapes, they, they have a tape, but um, the identification of the specific members has been a challenge and the, the tapes have been presented to the first deputy speaker. The speaker, um, I want to assure members that leadership will take the matter up. If parliament uh, tapes are not as visible as we're being told from the public affairs directorate, I believe that that day, there were other media uh, men in the chamber who might have recorded what happened. The Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Kwe, commended MPs that yesterday, when President Akufado was in the chamber, they didn't pull out any placards and they comported themselves. And he reminded MPs of a directive he had given that the wording of placards in the House is unparliamentary and that should not happen going forward. We are all agreed. The placards that is a constitute contempt of this honorable house. The seventh parliament has done something which has never happened in the political history of the fourth republic. And it should be recorded as a good example. And I congratulate all of you and hereby record it. Credit goes to both sides. MPs on both sides of the House welcome the directive by the Speaker that henceforth there shouldn't be the display of placards in the chamber. If, if Parliament leadership decide that no more placards, why not? We would abide by, by that. But it shouldn't be only when NDC is in opposition. When NDC becomes government as well, that rule must be, must be applied and, and then adhered to. Nowhere in the, in the practice of uh, parliamentary uh, practice you see uh, the placards. We always have... Uh, uh, outstanding orders. You can heckle, but not to display placards. If we do that, we we'll try to reduce the, uh, the parliament to the lowest uh, level because you cannot see that in anywhere. From Tuesday, parliament will be debating the President's State of the Nation's address that was delivered by President Akofado on Thursday. From Parliament House in Accra, Joseph Opokugapu reporting. And coming up in business news, business associations have welcomed President Akufuado's move to deal with losses accrued from tax exemptions in the country.
Now, MPs backing former President John Mahama are predicting a 93% win for him in tomorrow's NDC presidential primaries. The coordinator of the MPs for JM Group, Neil Ante Van Der Poel, who is also MP for Dududududu, says the grounds are looking good for a massive John Mahama victory. He has also taken on the six candidates contesting the former president in the NDC's primaries, describing them as unprincipled. He says Professor Joshua Labi, Ecos Fiogabra, Sylvester Mensa, and others could not even win their constituencies in the 2016 elections. It's obvious that John Dramani Mama will win. Uh, it's not part of the victory. We are concerned about the margin of victory. We are expecting nothing less than 93% of the total votes across the country. Uh, we are expecting him to make great, great impact in the Great Accra voter um, Ashanti and not the three northern regions. Uh, especially in Upper West Region, where Honorable ASK Babin comes from. 93 percent, yes. and there are seven of them contesting. Is yeah. that really feasible? Isn't that target far-fetched? I am, I am, I'm, I'm seeing Nuruddin not getting anything less than 0.01 percent. I'm seeing the rest getting approximately 1 percent, 1 percent across board. I don't see any of them garnering more than 2 percent. And what will the victory like that mean for him going into the 20? What it means simply is the fact that the NDC supporters who were this not, not too happy for one reason or the other, and I said sat on the fence, did not vote in 2016, which led to Nana Kufuado's victory in the elections. What it means is that all these people have now decided that NDC government is better than an MPP government and they're all coming back on board to work for the Socialist Party. Because most of the people who did not vote, I was privileged to have been a member of the Kwasi Bocho Committee as we went around the country. A lot of people who told us that they didn't vote were the constituency executives, who most of them are delegates now. And they told us the reason why they didn't vote. Today they themselves have come to the realization that they made a mistake. Well, former President John Dramani Mahama is calling on President Akufado to show leadership in the fight against party militias. The president of the State of the Nation Address on Thursday directed the two leading political parties to meet to end the phenomenon of party militias. But speaking on Accra-based radio station Radio Gold, the former president said the directive is too simplistic and will not work because the government has already embedded the vigilante groups into the country's security system. Uh, Ghana's former ambassador to the United States, Daniel Ognejakum, has endorsed President Kufado's threat to initiate legislation to end political party militia. He believes it is the way to go if leadership of the governing MPP and opposition NDC fail to reach common ground on the dissolution of their respective party militias. President Kufado told Parliament in the State of the Nation address on Thursday he had tasked the two leading parties to engage each other on the issue. The comments by Mr. Ohene Jakum, who is a campaign coordinator for former President John Mahama, somewhat contradicts his candidate's position on the matter. I'm, I'm hearing the expression political militias. I don't understand what it means. What I know is that there are so called regional tax forces, uh, the invis invisibles who claim to be invincible. The, the uh, hawks, the eagles, yeah, there are so many of them. I've said, and I'll repeat it, that personally I don't believe that any of these forces outside the police service, outside the military, can provide sufficient security for the communities, for our societies. No, absolutely not. So I don't believe in them. I believe that the military and the police have the capacity to provide security to the people of this country. And that's why I've suggested that Parliament must seriously consider enacting a law that would first disband all these various groups but ensure that no political party has the right, the constitutional or legal right, to establish any such force or forces. Okay. 
Mr. Oini Jokumi is meanwhile confident former President Mahama will secure more than 90% of the vote in Saturday's presidential primaries of the NDC. Statistics. But I would say the overwhelming majority in almost every constituency visited, they, they gave us out their word that they would give John Mahama 100% votes. There's only one place that they, they said they would give us 98%. And when I made the inquiry, he said, well, you know, sometimes some of the ballot papers may be destroyed and so on. That, that would account for the 2% that we can give to you. I said, oh, thank you very much. So in other words, nationally, from all the 275 constituencies, the promise, the undertaking, the word that they gave to us is that they will give John Mahama 100% of their votes. Meanwhile, the Ghana Police Service has issued security directives for the flag bearer election of the National Democratic Congress slated for Saturday, February 3, 2019. The statement signed by the Director General of Public Affairs, ACP, David Eklu reads, in view of the flag bearer elections of the National Democratic Congress slated for Saturday, February 23, 2019 at designated centers across the country, the police shall enforce the compliance of the following preventive measures with the aim of maximizing security before, during, and after the elections nationwide. We do apologize. We should have to drop uh, the graphics or the directives from the police. Moving on, the NDC flag bearer aspirant Dr. Ekospio-Gavra says lack of neutrality from party executives has crippled his campaign. He says some aspirants are unable to follow their shadow because regional and constituency leaders are reluctant to cooperate with them. Dr. Spio-Gavra alleges some party executives even demand money to organize party members for visiting aspirants. He says some party leaders also openly declare support for former President Mahama uh, in this weekend's election they will supervise. Dr. Ekot Fugabra spoke to the media as he rounded off his campaign in the Ashanti region. There are some chairmen, when you call them, you want to come to their constituency, they play all kinds of games to make it impossible for you to come to their constituency. There are some organizers who play these games. So there are many constituencies some of us have not been to because they put all kinds of impediments in our way. Other they say, you didn't call us in time, you didn't give us enough notice. When other people, other constituencies next to them are able to organize meetings in less than 24 hours or 48 hours, someone say, oh, you have to give me three days notice. You must write, write a letter to me and, or send me 5,000 CDs. When other constituencies will accept 500 CDs to organize a meeting for you, others will say, no, send me 1,000, send me 1,500. All kinds of things that make it difficult. But beyond that, you also, also heard yourself, not me telling you, some high level officers of the party chairman of the party, general secretary of the party, regional chairman, and others saying, we support this particular candidate. They're not supposed to say that. They are the referees in the football match. Victory is the thumbprint of the electorate. And the electorate, when they count one, two, three, four, the thumbprint is five. And I'm number five. So it's so very automatic for most of them. Those who listen to it, those who reason it, they can't vote for two fingers. They can't vote for three fingers. They can vote for five fingers. Dr. Spiogabra, however, alleges he will support whoever emerges. Dr. Spiogabra pledged he will support whoever emerges, Victor. It's what they say that NDC is a lame horse, or he was riding a lame horse for the 2016 election. The fact that the horse was lame is the very reason why you can't win a race. You need the horse that is in, you know, horse racing um, post position, that is strong, that they can run a, ho a horse race and win. And so I'm talking about strengthening the party. I've got a seven-point agenda document which talks about how to build constituency offices, for example, which NDC has not done for the 25 years it's been in existence, 16 years in power. Many of our constituencies are locked up in kiosks, in containers, in people's backyards and, and so forth. How to strengthen the women's wing, the youth wing, especially through training and um, vocational technical now, Deputy Upper West Commander of the Ghana Police Service, ACP Peter Indekugri and Nabugri, has warned persons who will parade themselves as party militia vigilantes to stay off from all polling stations 
in the region or risk the wrath of the police. He says the police are in absolute charge of all polling centers and will not entertain any other person who may show up on the day to want to claim that role. ATP Peter in Dekugri gave the warning after ballot papers meant for the elections were brought to the Upper West Police Headquarters for onward dispatch to polling stations in the region. Journey's Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam reports from WA. Upper West Regional Chairman of the National Democratic Congress, Abdul Nasr Sani, popular known as Bonas, led officials of the party to the Upper West Regional Police Headquarters where the ballot papers are kept under lock and key. They were joined by electoral officers from all 11 municipal and districts in the Upper West Region. One municipal commander of the Ghana Police Service, DSP Vincent Napier, led them to check through all the seals to ensure that they are intact and not tempered with. Upper West Regional Secretary of the NDC, Lawyer Charles Longa Pozung, told Joy News that they are satisfied with the process so far and hope for successful polls on Saturday. So it's been successful, it's been sorted out with the agents, with the Electoral Commission, the chairman, my party chairman for the region is equally here. So we're happy with so far the arrangements that have been made. Deputy Upper West Commander of the Ghana Police Service, ACP Peter Ndekur Anaburi, stated that they are prepared for the election and will deal ruthlessly with people who come to polling centers and play themselves as party militia or vigilantes. We are more than prepared. Tomorrow we go to the police, the police and you see the, the police men yourself. I will not stand here and tell you I'm sending two police men, three police men. But we are going to militarize every police center. Nobody should dare to come to the police and to do that thing. If anyone should dare me, I'll dare that person. A total of 8,910 voters comprising of branch executives, former government functionaries, constituency and regional executives will take part in the elections in the Upper West Region. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wow. And I'm Israel. I thank you very much for watching. You have a good night.